All right. Well, that was a great presentation by Andre. Uh, I think a lot of things that I'm going to talk about dovetail very well here. Um, so I'm Sean Ferguson. I'm the Associate Dean of Master's Programs at the Business School. Uh, I oversee the MBA and the Master's of Science programs. I've been here for about two years, and before that I worked at Rice University in the United States at their business school in a similar capacity. Currently, I serve on the board of the Graduate Management Admissions Council, GMAC, and GMAC is one of the industry groups that oversees, um, you know, industry professional group. It's a $100 million corporation, or not corporation, but a not-for-profit entity, uh, and so, so I get a lot of insights on where business school is going and things like that. And so Andre nailed a lot of key points. And what I'm going to do in my presentation is kind of frame some of it through the lens of how we're doing it on the ground at HKUST. And I'll probably draw in some of my other experiences at Rice University and things that I've observed through benchmarking, access to information that I've had on the board of GMAC, and we'll go from there. So I'm going to cover four areas. I'm going to talk about our strategy and approach, and then when I talk about it, I'll relate it to kind of the broader things that are going on in the market. We'll talk about big trends and the macro situation. Uh, we'll talk about the admissions approach that we've developed, marketing and admissions approach that we've developed to kind of deal with some of these challenges. And then um, product innovations that we're looking at, and I think a lot hit on what Andre talked about earlier. So it's funny. Uh, until this day, we didn't even coordinate, but you, you might find some, some uh, amazing uh, synchronization of themes. So, so the first thing for us is that uh, the business school, and as it relates to the master's programs and the MBA programs, is uh, I'm, I'm big into mission alignment and um, you know, using your mission to drive strategy. And I think where a lot of business schools have gone astray is that the top part, when you look at the mission, everyone has that. I went to a conference and they put up like mission statements for all the business schools and they asked the audience which one is yours, right? And the audience, like they put up five and 90% of the audience raised their hand for all five of the mission statements, right? Uh, and so, you know, everyone wants to be global, everyone wants to develop leaders and contribute uh, to the economic or social, uh, or social impact of where they're from, something in that uh, vein. For us, you know, and, and particularly in my role, what we're focused on is really driving that towards something. Uh, and, and so one of the things when I came to HKUST, and it was a similar problem that we had at Rice University, is that, you know, a lot of schools have Harvard envy. Um, you know, everyone wants to be like Harvard or Stanford or Wharton or what have you. And what you really have to do is drive towards a mission that is relevant to what you can be, right? And so for us, I really wanted us to get more clear on how we're going to approach the market. And so international is key for us, particularly being in Hong Kong. And um, Hong Kong is probably one of Asia's most international cities. And, and when you think about a business school or the programs in a business school, they have to align with what the region does well. And some of the areas that Andre talked about, uh, if you're, you know, when you talk about differentiation and things like that, um, and when I was in Houston at Rice University, I happened to be a student there and then came back later after working in consulting. And when I was a student and for most of the existence of the school, people fought being an energy school. Well, we don't want to be an energy school. You know, we have Harvard M Envy. We want to be a generalist school and we want to serve all these different things. But the reality of the situation was that we didn't have that kind of scale. And whether we liked it or not, energy was taking us up and down. So, at some point, we came to the realization, might as well capture more of the upside when it goes up and try and mitigate some of the things that, the bad things that happen when the energy industry goes down. And I think lots of schools are starting to figure that out now. You can't be Harvard, you know, if you're Emory, if you're UNC or whoever, you can't be Harvard, you can't be Chicago, you can't be Wharton. But what you can do is serve your markets well, and you can find areas of expertise that may be germane to your location or the, the skills that your alumni base have developed over time and things like that. And so for us, international is one of the big things here. And so we want to be Asia's premier uh, international MBA program, and we want to be a consensus top 10 uh, global graduate program. And so consensus is also a key, view, uh, key word here because uh, it, it means to me a comprehensiveness in how we represent ourselves. So uh, we've done very well in the Financial Times rankings at HKUST, uh, but we never talked about the rankings where we didn't do well in. And so uh, for me, it's like I don't care if I'm top 10 or top 15 in this ranking and I'm 60th in that ranking. 
And so we really want to make sure whatever we're doing, we're doing it at a high level and with excellence. And so we've come up with a framework that helps us think about that. And um, this kind of holds us accountable to keep us from getting uh, fat and happy, you know, and, and not let us know that while we've done some great things, there's still a lot of more things for us to go. So um, when we think about the consensus approach, one of the things that we've done is come up with the success factors. So if you take all the rankings, any one ranking by themselves is kind of, uh, it doesn't tell the whole story, but then when you aggregate them together and you decompose them, these are kind of the four factors that come out of it, right? So you're creating an experience that someone uh, is likely to recommend. Did you meet the student's expectations? Did this drive value for the alumni? Things like that. Um, education, um, since we're all not-for-profits, a lot of it is a reputation business and how we kind of gain our currency is by elevating the profile of the school uh, through the research of our faculty or the accomplishments of our students. And so you always want to work to raise that visibility. And then career progression. One of the things that we have in business schools that's different than a lot uh, of other um, um, educational areas is that most of the time, students, you know, it's a sensitive subject because we are an academic institution, but what's really driving a lot of the enrollment and interest in management education is career progression, measured either in salary, promotions, things like that. And so for us as a school and what we have to push back to our faculty and our other constituents is what we do add value. And so this is, this is actually not bad because it makes sure we're relevant. And so we, we track factors related to this. Um, and then the last thing is about the three C's, culture, camaraderie, and connectedness. And so there's a lot of research out there about how networks, people with the best networks tend to do well and things like that. And you know, you know most business schools, you know, there's these kind of anecdotes that 50% of you know, business school is networking and things like that. And so th these four success factors, and we're using them here and we use them at Rice, uh, I really think give you a comprehensiveness of the impact of MBA programs and graduate programs. And this kind of frames how we go to market. And uh, it's been a successful framework at my prior stop and we're in the process of implementing it here. Now, sometimes what's happening is that those, those kind of success factors here, these are kind of you know, our enduring you know, criteria for success, right? Uh, these probably will never change over time. They're like fundamentals of the business, right? But then there's kind of at any point in time, there's urgent priorities that you really need to revisit. And so uh, when, we came, when I came here at, uh, at HKUST, um, four things stood out to me. We didn't have great awareness of what was going on in the market. So uh, without that, we can't figure out how to differentiate. Uh, we can't figure out who to serve. We can't see how we stand relative to our competitors. And so over the last 18 months since I've been here, really been focused on helping my team learn more about where we sit uh, in the pantheon of everything. And when we, I think when we have a better understanding of that, we can say, okay, how do our strengths, our weaknesses kind of match up to the market and the competitors? Who do they appeal to? That kind of thing. The next thing is um, delivering a, a world-class uh, experience. And so uh, one of the things that I think universities kind of get caught up in is that uh, well, we're faculty and they're students, right? And so that means they don't have any rights and they don't have the, they don't have the right to have expectations. And what we've really tried to focus on, and we get in this debate in the industry, you know, I've been in conferences and they say, well, and this is important because MBA programs charge a lot of money relative to undergrad and master's programs. Well, they're not customers, uh, they're students. And I agree with some portions of that, but you know, I, I tell people, it doesn't matter whether we call them customers or not, they have expectations. And here, you know, we have people paying $500,000 for an MBA program, 500,000 Hong Kong dollars. In the US, some places charge as much as 120,000 US dollars. And so whether they're customers or not, they have expectations. And whenever you're offering something, you have a responsibility to try and meet those expectations. The next thing we talk about is our career and professional development um, organization had challenges because the market for opportunity in Asia is not as developed as it is in the United States. And so what we really have to do is figure out, a, a lot of how HKUST's business school was built was built on a US business school model, uh, but the way people get jobs in this region, um, the things that are driving growth, so the reality for a lot of our students being an international uh, business school is that 
In the U.S., the language of, that's driving all the economic growth is English, so there's no disconnect between what they're learning in the class from a communication standpoint to what's going on in the marketplace. But over here, the, the, the language that's driving the most growth in this region is Chinese. So as a business school, we're, we're importing people whose mode of um, management communication is English, how do they find opportunities in there? So we have to adapt our hiring model, linking people with things, uh, that kind of thing. And then repositioning our part-time MBA programs. So part-time MBA programs, and I'll talk about this more later, used to be just the kind of mechanism to use up excess capacity in the evening or the weekends. But what's happening in a lot of the marketplace is that with, you know, particularly in this side of the world, less people are going to the United States for kind of the, you know, the, the end of the rainbow kind of career because they already have great opportunities here. It doesn't make sense to go to the, leave Unilever and Procter & Gamble to go, uh, Unilever in China to go work for Procter & Gamble in the United States. And so what you're, we're seeing more of is Chinese students and Indian students staying home, maybe pursuing an evening program or a weekend program or something like that. And so we need to not treat part-time programs as excess capacity or something you do in the evening and it's a stripped down version of the full-time program we need to try and provide the same level of utility in that program defined for that market instead of trying to force them into a full-time model. So, so these priorities are urgent for us right now and over the, next, over the last 18 months and the next you know, 12 to 15 months really trying to address these. So now when you look at the uh, transit admissions, um, ranking stature is not enough to attract candidates to your program anymore. Um, the market has gotten so much more sophisticated. You have consultants, you have all kinds of books and periodicals out there telling people how they should evaluate uh, business schools. So you have to be more sophisticated in your marketing. Uh, a couple of years ago here at HKUST, we had the world's top 10 campaign, right? That, that's all we sold in our marketing. We're a top 10 school. And um, what that did is it, it didn't really tell anything about who we were as a school or an MBA program. What it did was just tell you what we were ranked. And so we got a lot of great students, but we got students who came here because, all right, if we were eighth in the world, they didn't get into one through, one through uh, seven, right? And you can't really serve the needs of such a diverse constituents who came here for many different reasons. So if you're looking to uh, you know, have a career, a US-like career in Asia, there was a lot of ex expectation misalignment. Uh, it's also important, uh, to cover the mass market um, while keeping the experience personal. And so as an international business school, what, the, what this means is that we have to raise awareness. Uh, you probably can figure this out. There's not a lot of Europeans or Americans or Latin Americans in, in, in Hong Kong or in this region. So you have to have a mass market presence. That's kind of expensive, uh, but you have to figure out innovative ways to get your brand and, and your name out there. But at the same time, because you're a small school, one of the things that you have to sell is that you're an intimate environment. We only have 100 students per class uh, that come in our full-time program. And you know, Harvard has 900 per class, or Wharton has 700 per class. And so these things help us differentiate. But when you're trying to do it big and small at the same time, it can be a management challenge. Uh, I talked about growth opportunities in Asia, keeping students at home. Uh, visa issues in the United States make the investment a ri risky proposition for a lot of students on this side of the world. And, you know, growth forecast in Asia is uh, from 5 to 7 percent. And so when we put up the slide earlier talking about what growth looks like, uh, 5 to 7 percent over a long period of time makes this the center of opportunity in this part of the world. And then the other thing is programmatic alignment is key, both internally and externally. Um, you know, here and at many business schools, one of the things that people do is like, okay, what does our faculty do best and what are they most interested in? And that's what we offer. Um, but if there's not a market for it outside of here, we have to figure out how to redeploy that in a way that makes it relevant for the, uh, for the market and the students. Also, you know, being aligned with the, the region, if you look at most business schools, maybe at least 50 to 75 percent of the hiring happens probably within a 100 to 200 mile radius of the business school. So it makes sense that Columbia is a finance school or Stanford is a technology and entrepreneurship school um, or that Rice was an energy school, right? 
Uh, but if you don't have courses that align to what that market serves, if you don't have students or who are interested in working in those markets, then you're going to have a breakdown and you're not going to be able to hit your goals. So these are some of the things that are going on. And, um, and I don't think these are HKUST specific things. These are things going on across the, uh, across the industry. And so what's happened with GMAT uh, scores and uh, uh, test taking, they've declined over the last five years. Uh, most of the declines are, they're coming from all over the world. They're coming from Asia, uh, particularly China and India, and then the U.S. And um, what you've seen is just a steady decline over time because the MBA isn't the answer for everything. And full-time programs in particular, which drove a lot of these test scores, are no longer the, the priority for individuals. Uh, and I talked about earlier how everyone is, you know, becoming more sophisticated. People used to send their GMAT test scores to three and a half different schools. Now it's down to 2.83. That's a 20% decrease. And so as a school, we have to kind of evolve to these realities as far as what's going on. And so the decline in scores sent has also resulted in a decline in applications. And they hit us. Um, particularly hard and so what we've had to do is figure out how to manage these declines in scores and so um, and when you lose applications then yield management becomes a priority and what that means is before maybe we used to get 20 applications from France now if we get uh, maybe we get 10 applications from France we still want to take five of the best French students so we have to focus really really hard on you know converting those into students in the program and so it really hasn't hit us from an enrollment standpoint, and we've actually improved in quality in terms of GMAT score and sa incoming salaries and things like that. But the effort has been a lot more to make sure we kind of get the students that we want. Now, when we you know, layer the macro trends on top of what's going on with us uh, and how we're going to go to market, uh, we've been more focused on value and brand building. Uh, because those are the things that are going to kind of carry you through the day. If you over-commoditize the business, uh, you're not going to have a viable future. And I think Andre hit on some great points in there uh, talking about that. And so the very, very, very strong schools, are they're going to be okay. I don't think any of this stuff is going to hit Harvard or Stanford. Uh, I think even to the top 25 or 35, they'll be okay if they command their markets strong, strongly. But uh, it's all going to be important as far as how you execute and how quickly you come to the reality of things. And so uh, the downward application trend, we're trying to, you know, strengthen the education of the value of the MBA. And that's not just for students coming into the program. You know, one of the things that's happening in Asia is that when I go talk to a company about hiring our students, they say, how much do MBA students cost? And I say, 80 to $100,000 US. And I say, oh, you know, in Hong Kong, you probably can get four undergraduate students for that. And so the awareness about the value of the MBA isn't the same. And so, and, and you know, what I've tried to tell my team, and I have to set expectations and tell my students, this isn't an HKUST problem. This is a problem throughout the industry. So when I talk to the people at SEABS in Shanghai, or NUS, or NCI, uh, a lot of it is that the HR gatekeepers aren't really thinking big picture about their talent needs, all right? So we have to sell value on the front end and the back end of the process. And so there's always in the popular press that, that, so I've been in this business for 10 years and the MBA has been dead and come back about five times. So, uh, and so some of it's cyclical, some of it makes for good selling, um, but you know, I think it's, it is becoming more challenging. The competition just, you know, continues to put, you know, um, more emphasis on brand awareness. And, you know, I think you have to do, you know, what some schools are making this mistake is rather than investing now, they're just cutting and, and continuing to cut. And if, if you continue to cut and you don't invest in your marketing, your branding and your messaging over the long term, before you know it, your, your applicant pool will decrease so much that you won't have anything to choose from in the future. And so if you're a high quality inf institution, but you don't have the awareness, you're not going to be able to attract the students that you want to continue to grow your reputation and advance the school. Uh, and so, um, so and, and the applicants are so much more sophisticated. The internet has made everything so transparent. Um, and you know, with our staff, you know, I'm always telling them, you know, we have to be better at managing the students' expectations and serving them because there's always loose cannons out there who will go to a message board or post something on the internet about your school or what you do and you don't do. 
Now, our approach to marketing and missions, and, and this framework can be applied to anyone, right? And so we have, you know, kind of the peers who we see, and then there's our aspirants, and you have to think about this as you craft your approach. And so there's schools that we aspire to be like, you know, Harvard, London, Wharton, uh, et cetera. But then, you know, you have to take care of your own backyard first, because if you don't beat your most nearest competitors, you'll never be able to get to a level where you can see yourself with your global aspirants. And so establishing our point of differentiation is the key. And this is where this falls down for a lot of business schools. Uh, people talk about global, t people talk about Asia. I mean, there's some schools on here who uh, conveniently they say Asia, but they really mean China, but they've said Asia so that they can broaden who they recruit. Students come in and they realize it's not Asia, it's really about China, and there's dissatisfaction, right? Or they don't have a plan to get to Asia from China within their curriculum, their offering, and that kind of thing. And so for us, uh, where we kind of, the, the kind of framework, you know, as we thought about where we want to go, there's the mass market, prestige, super top notch, and then China, Asia, global. And right now we're sitting at what we feel at the top of the prestige end, and we're in this Asia place, but we're not quite to NCI, we're not quite to Harvard or Wharton. We, we don't think we can ever be truly that global because our scale, it'll take you know, many decades to kind of get to the scale where our alumni base is spread and dispersed throughout the world where we have that kind of influence, but we feel like we can be further, even more top notch within Asia. Now, you know, our brand pyramid, you know, we, based on the two uh, frameworks I showed you earlier, our identity, top notch program globally, but the best in Asia, you know, our mission is to groom future leaders in Asia, contributing to the region of the world, to, to the region and the world. And then our brand DNA, right? So what we wanted to do is think about how we fit in the pantheon of business schools. We're not even 25 years old yet. And so, uh, you know, what we, what we want to do is use that to our advantage. So we're, we're young, maybe we're kind of hip, we're a little bit inspiring. We're still world class, incredible, but we're, we're vibrant. And then the reasons to believe, uh, we're reputable, we have world-class faculty, you know, and what I tell our team is that uh, our faculty are amongst the greatest in the world. If you look at the UT Dallas uh, research rankings, we're in the top 20 academically. Um, that's amazing for a school of this age. Uh, we have great talent that we recruit from all over the world, and we have Asia expertise in here. And so, uh, so these are the kind of factors that when our marketing team thinks about how we go to market and what we want to convey, this is where everything starts. Now, you know, the, the other thing that, you know, I've shown you a lot of frameworks and these are all kind of standard MBA frameworks. Uh, what happens at business schools is that we teach our students all this stuff, but we don't put any of it into practice. And so, um, you know, one of the things that we've tried to put into our business school here, and a lot more business schools are doing it, is putting this marketing d discipline into, into the process. And so uh, when you think about the process, we're focused on raising awareness, persuasion, getting people to consider us, and then yielding them, all right? Now, for being an international business school, um, you know, there's outside of the region, the developing countries, the developing EU, the U.S. and the developed EU, each of those places require a different message for us. Um, when you get into Asia, other Asia, you may not need to do as much awareness. I think people have a great sense of who we are. And then for Hong Kong, China, and India, China and India, for example, we don't have to do much marketing there because the volume that we get uh, is, is, is so large. Uh, you know, we'll get 200 applications from India, and you know, for a program that's 100, you know, we'll only probably take about seven or eight students. So it's really about yielding the ones that we really want and think are the right fit for us. Now, you got to take uh, when you have MBA programs or master's programs, you got to see how they fit. Uh, and so, um, when you think about our portfolio of MBA programs, you've, we have a part-time program in Shenzhen, a part-time program in Hong Kong, uh, and a full-time program. And these break across the kind of career switcher dimension and the career advancement dimension. And that's how we position them. And when we think about pricing, we want to make sure that they're you know, significantly spaced out and differentiated from each other. And so we're, we, we used to have this problem where the part-time Hong Kong and the part-time Shenzhen were priced exactly the same. 
but they're very different. The students are different, obviously, because if you're based in Shenzhen, you're going to get a different, you're going to get probably more mainland students. If you're based in Hong Kong, you're going to get more Hong Kong students. And so we, you know, we had to think about the marketing there. What you don't see on here, our KH program is part of this portfolio. But you know, when you think about the pricing, our pricing relative to that program, all, you also have to keep it in mind. So for us, I think we've done a good job, and most schools do a good job. But I think uh, mass media is one of the areas for us we need to focus on. And so as we've thought about what we need to do from a, a marketing standpoint to enhance our brand, we've also thought about what we need to deliver from a value standpoint in order to get the revenues that we need to kind of have the marketing expense we need to, to, to you know, uh, raise awareness for the program. And so it represents the largest opportunity for us. Um, these are just some of the tactics that you need to think about in the admissions world um, and how you get to people. Um, so there's a various, various ways to get there. And one of the things you'll see is that more and more these are becoming more technology oriented uh, mechanisms to, to attract people. Our dean is very reluctant to spend any money on something that goes into print advertising. Uh, and I think it makes sense because for every dollar we spend here, we can track and come up with an ROI metric for it. And this is where most schools are going in the industry. Some are going at rates faster than the others. Uh, one of the things that you know, we did this year, and more schools are doing it, you know, 10 years ago, enterprise uh, systems, CRM systems, really couldn't adapt to the higher education industry. So a market emerged for uh, MBA-oriented CRM systems. They were better than a homegrown system, but they weren't as robust and powerful as enterprise systems. And so when I got here at HKUST, uh, one of the things that's, um, as a University of Science and Technology, we do have very, very bright people, and a lot of our systems were homegrown, made by someone who was from the university. Now, they made a good system for an individual to make a system, right? But that system cannot be as good as something that's been market tested, uh, many use cases were uh, created in order to come up with the best solution. And so when I got here, I was kind of surprised at the level that we were at. And we were looking at systems to go to, and my first inclination was, well, let's go use Hobson's Apply Yourself, which is kind of the industry standard for enrollment management and CRM for higher education. And when we thought about it, we were so far behind from a technology standpoint, and because of that, you know, we didn't have processes that were really built to take advantage of technology. And so, you know, we were sitting down, and, and Salesforce kind of came up as something that we should use as a tool. It, it was very risky, and we were sitting there, well, no one's really done it. Maybe one or two schools has used Salesforce. But the example that I use with the team is that, well, Maybe these other systems are almost at the end of their you know, life, right? Uh, enterprise systems have continued to become more robust. Uh, you can almost customize them to anything. Um, and so what's happened is that, um, you know, I, I, my father's from Jamaica, and I remember going to Jamaica as a kid, and you know, nobody had a telephone. And if I ever wanted to call, you know, my grandparents, there's like one phone in Jackson Town, all right? And you, you go to Jackson Town, and if you want to call back home, there's no calling back home. But in the span of 10 years, you know, like the next time I went to Jamaica, guess what? No one had a, you know, a landline phone, but everyone had a cell phone. And this was before I had a cell phone in the US, right? And so that place skipped a generation in technology. And then, you know, if you look at through all, all the developing world, you know, cell phone technology is way more advanced in some cases, not in the raw technology itself, but the application of it for day-to-day -day life needs. And we moved to Salesforce because we wanted, we were so far behind in order to kind of shake things up, we wanted to go to the next generation and go where the ball was going as opposed to following the ball, the ball where it's going. And so a lot of that infrastructure is helping better enable us to explore technology, uh, to kind of get feedback and measure and what resonates well with um, the marketplace and things like that. And so really focusing on innovation, and I think what this has helped with in our staff is to stop thinking the way that we used to think and thinking about how things are going in the future, which is kind of what we want our students to do. Uh, because one of the tough parts about being in business education, you get the best students in the world to come there, 
And so they're already thinking about, you know, big picture kind of things and the next innovation. And then when you deliver to them a product that doesn't really, you know, represent everything that they're looking for and that what you're trying to tell them that you're teaching them about, it creates a disconnect that erodes your credibility. So, um, so in order to do this, this costs money. So uh, unlike a lot of schools right now are cutting, and, but we're going to be increasing our marketing budget uh, to kind of facilitate the things that I've talked about earlier, uh, building awareness, um, enhancing social media presence, uh, year-round marketing versus the seasonal marketing that's kind of common in the education business. And someone else created this slide. I'm like, premiumization. Okay, I'll, I'll go with it. I'll use it for the event. It's probably too business jargony and not academic enough, but we'll, we'll go with it in this presentation. Now, we're talking about some of the innovations and where other thing, where things are going in, in, in this section. And so first, um, I think programs designed specifically for working professionals is the future. And so as Andre mentioned, uh, the full-time program isn't for everyone anymore. There's a huge student migration from the full-time MBA market and from the EMBA market. And uh, one of the things that's happening in the EMBA market is that a lot of that market was built off the back of corporate entities sponsoring people to go to an MBA program, uh, EMBA program. And those individuals probably wouldn't have went to get, they wouldn't, they wouldn't have paid their own money to go to an EMBA program um, at the stage of their career where they're at. So if you think about uh, the individual who may be 45 years old, maybe has a kid who's 15 to 13 years old, are you really going to, you know, you may have 10 to 15 years left in your career, are you really gonna, you know, shell out $100,000 of your own money for an EMBA when you may or may not have one or two promotions left. And then you look at your kid and you're like, I gotta pay for this guy to go to college in a couple of years. And so, so I think you know, the trend there is you know, really, you know, um, I, I, the, the future of EMBA programs I don't think is bright at all, only for the super, super premium, all right? And so in the full-time side, on the, and on the flip side, the cost you know, in the chart that Andre showed, tuition has gone up. And I, you know, that chart resonated with me because I just thought back to, it was maybe over 15 years or whatever, when I got out of business school and I look at what my students are graduating with today, I'm like, the salaries aren't that much different, but the costs are tremendously different. And so I don't know how much longer you have to really, you know, for that, mile, that, that model to be viable. Um, now, in this part of the world, I think part-time MBA programs are grossly underpriced in Hong Kong and Shenzhen and Asia as well. And so I don't know why we did it, but um, our part-time MBA program only costs about $40,000 US and our full-time program costs about 30,000 US. Now, in most of the world, uh, we did this benchmarking analysis and usually the ratio of part-time to full-time tuition is one to one. Here, it's 0.65. Uh, and so what I've told my team is we have to create that. Uh, and we have to reconcile that um, gap that we have. And they're like, well, people won't come. And I'm like, well, we should just run a more efficient, smaller program than giving it away for free. Because our, our cost structure here, when you're a top 20 research university, <laughs> is the same as the cost structure at you know, Michigan or uh, the top state schools in the United States. Uh, we, offer, we already offer more services and benefits than our competition uh, in the part-time market, and we're gonna to continue to offer more. So I talked about not treating part-time programs as stripped-down versions that you've retrofitted from your full-time program, but we're talking about them more providing utility that's relevant to that particular market. And so, um, you know, we've been doing more of that, um, and I'll talk about some of those things later. Um, and in Asia, in the United States, this, this kind of repositioning of part-time markets has already happened. So uh, they're, they're, they call them MBA for professionals, or UCLA calls it the FIMBA program, fully employed MBA program. Uh, so people don't want to you know, call it the part-time program or the evening program because those kind of terms are pejorative in nature and they kind of convey something less than, right? And so if you think about marketing and, and selling something that has a lot of value, if you have something value, would you ever call it the half this or the part time that? It's, it's a bad way to go about business. The other thing is that I think online technology in the classroom, uh, online or technology in the classroom, it's not a matter of if but when. 
And I think, you know, in a lot of schools, there's this debate amongst the faculty about, well, this is, I just don't believe in it, or uh, this, this will never happen, or it's not quality. You know, the innovators are out there figuring out how to make it quality. And the thing is, if you don't kind of commit to this, by the time you figure it out, everyone else will have, the people who have figured it out will be so far ahead of you. And, and I think this is gonna be like a nuclear bomb across the industry, you know? So, um, so people need to embrace it uh, because people want to be able to learn. Uh, and, and I think the point about, you know, th you know the kind of um, disaggregation of MBA learning moving to either online, maybe short courses and things like that. I think online gives you the flexibility to preserve some of the MBA elements to it. And if, if, if business schools embrace online, I think it may give them, you know, 20 or 30 more years of having the MBA kind of at the centerpiece of the school. But if they don't embrace the technology, the MBA might not have more than 10 years left. So, so this one, um, so we've done a few pretty cool things so far. This year we launched our first ever online MBA course, and it was a corporate finance course this year. Now, we had one of our best faculty do the course, and he's won teaching awards and everything, right? But the data is kind of split in two poles. There are some people who like the flexibility and the value that it provides. There are a lot of video components that this faculty member put in the course. So, you know, if you're in the class, in a real-time kind of class, you couldn't always uh, keep up with them and maybe you couldn't rewind a faculty member, but now you can rewind it. So there's a segment of the population that really appreciated this. Uh, then there's a segment of the, pop <laughs> the, the population that's like, well, I paid for real life instruction and that's what I want. And, from, and so they didn't like the course as much. And so, um, but you know, my, the faculty member came to me and he was, he was very kind of disturbed about how the students received it. And you know, when we sat down and talked about it, I was like, yeah, that guy, he, wasn't, he, was, he was against you before you even walked into the room. So don't worry about it. And I think what universities have to do is be willing to be committed to these initiatives and support the faculty as opposed to uh, bail out on them when the going gets tough. Because I think once you kind of nail this thing, the, the upside of the value is tremendous. Uh, another point that Andre brought up was the networks, right? So we just recently joined the Yale Global Network. And so in this network is about a network of 30 schools across the world. And um, it was a brilliant idea by Yale to say, okay, we're gonna get the best business schools in the world, you know, from Mexico, from Thailand, from Australia, uh, Brazil, whatever. And we're gonna collaborate on things, you know, because we're all, we can't be all things to all people, but it, within the network, we can basically have an exchange of various things. And so the, the key piece of it is that um, we provide a couple of network weeks, I think three to four network weeks a year, where each school hosts a week of kind of curricular learning. And then what happens is, you know, all, you know, maybe 15 of the schools are doing it simultaneously. You can send you know, some of the students to Brazil. Brazil can send a couple of students to Hong Kong. Hong Kong, HKUST can send a couple of students uh, to Israel, that kind of thing. So rather than putting on study abroad trips for 15 different countries, you know, you can have this kind of shared platform and it, it really drives value for your students. And so we're excited about doing that. Next week we actually have our, our first Global Network Week where we're bringing students in. And what's great about the Yale Global Network, so in the full-time program, the Yale Global Network is just basically, basically an exchange program, right? So an exchange program, you got plenty of time to spend three or four months at another school. But if you're thinking about working professionals and part-time students, they don't have three or four months to do an exchange. And you know, it's, it's funny that you know, part of the rationale for exchange is that we want to provide this broadening experience and things like that. And you know, if the part-time is supposed to be you know, a cousin of the full-time program, then you've got to find a mechanism to be thematically consistent. And so the, the net global network allows us to provide this kind of experiential broadening experience in a more you know, abbreviated fashion. Also, uh, you know, real world networking, right? So, and not networking like going to a reception and drinking wine and eating uh, uh, hors d'oeuvres. This piloted growth lab course is something that we're doing with Kellogg where we're putting students on the same team. And so we have one team that is gonna be a part of this course at Kellogg 
And what they're doing is helping a Brazilian, um, I think, food and beverage company figure out how to penetrate the Hong Kong market. And what's great is that the students in our program will be able to work with students in the Kellogg program. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's another broadening experience where you don't necessarily have to travel to another school, but it's kind of good in that it's, it's very similar to maybe how you would have to work if you were at headquarters in Brazil and you're trying to figure out with your team in China how you're going to go to business, go to market, all right? Uh, another thing that we've added in our part-time program is we have this by application leading with impact course. Uh, so what we do there is the students in our part-time program, what's really great is that, and I think one of the great value pieces for part-time or executive education is that you take it as you learn it and you apply it immediately in the class and in the workplace, right? And so our students do 360 assessments. They have to you know, fill out an application of why they want to participate. And then we you know, provide them counseling and coaching on how to interpret and assess the 360-degree feedback. And it's great for them, right? Because most of the people, you have to have uh, subordinates. Um, you know, you have to have a pretty good uh, peer level so you can get multiple points of view there. And so it's been a great, um, great um, program for our students in our part-time program. And I think these are things that are different interpretations of what we, you would see in the full-time program. So in the full-time program, we said the team experience, you kind of get this 360 coaching because you're with the same team throughout the course of the uh, first year of an MBA program. But this actually makes it relevant because you're doing it with your coworkers. So not only are you learning something, but you're improving your performance while you're going through the school. And then orientation, we're revamping that and the whole onboarding process. And so what we really want to do, we're thinking about creating a product that delivers a transformative experience. I think that'll drive word of mouth over the long term. A lot of other cool things are going on. and. I think my observation, I'd like to think that we're the only school that's doing some of these things, but um, you know, one of the things that um, I found out is that there's always someone else smarter in the, in the room than you, and that's okay. You just want to be somewhat close to that person, right? Uh, and so you know, we have, uh, the, the expectations of our students dictate that you know, we can't you know, sit, on our, sit on our hands. And I always tell our team that you, know, you have to have a forward lean, right? because you, there's no staying the same in this business. You're either getting better or worse, all right? And so when you think about likelihood to recommend, service excellence uh, was a big um, challenge for us. And one of the factors where we scored routinely low is um, how our, our staff deal with our students, right? So we tend to be very rule-oriented. There's no exceptions and things like that. But you go to a US business school, everything depends, right? Um, you know, much more student-centric, that kind of thing. And so what we're doing right now is a staff rebalancing, which is tough in the context of a, a public university in which we bring on, you know, more um, higher skilled, um, higher skilled employees who can be multifunctional and multi-stakeholder. Uh, and then natural attrition, you know, will kind of upgrade as we, um, you know, make this, uh, we'll upgrade positions as people leave um, the organization. Uh, put, putting an emphasis on training, it, it's really amazing at a university how much we're all about learning and training, but how much we never do much of this with our own staff. And so, um, you know, we really want to bring this to the forefront and help our people get better. Um, I'm a big proponent of if you don't track, whatever gets measured gets done. And so um, before we didn't really have a benchmarking surveying system, but now what we do is we look at students' experience at different points with entry, exit, and alumni surveys. Uh, so that's really been helpful in terms of helping us see where we're at and then work to improve results. I talked about the global network and uh, flexibility. The other thing that we're doing is adding more professionally oriented electives. And so um, our curriculum, you know, is pretty rigid, but we're trying to add more block week courses to, to make sure that we have an opportunity for our students to get exposed to areas uh, of interest uh, and things that are emerging. So energy is a big area. Even, if, even though this isn't Singapore or Houston, a lot of our students have perspective or want perspective on this industry and need to know it as future leaders. But Hong Kong doesn't have the same depth of energy expertise. And so by coming up with a, a curriculum format that allows us for week-long electives, we can kind of import you know, practitioner talent into Hong Kong in order to teach some of these classes. 
Um, awareness and visibility, we talked about you know, Salesforce earlier. Uh, the other piece that we do is admissions development. And so what we want to use is this um, technology to enable admissions development. Admissions development is just basically like business development or corporate development. And it's getting, uh, using kind of the, the, the sales funnel in order to get senior leaders close to people in order to get conversion and things like that. Uh, career progression is a, a huge area. And so we've used, not just used Salesforce on the marketing and admissions side, but also on the corporate side and, and, and how we're gonna engage them to get them closer to our students. Um, Sean, yeah. Try to wrap up yeah, we're, I'm almost done. All right, so, uh, so, so, and then the last thing, culture, camaraderie, and connectedness. Uh, the relationships and networks are an important part of business school, and so we've tried to, uh, people try to build the alumni culture at the end of the program, and it's something that you have to start at the beginning and during the program so that they want to come back after the program. So, so these are some of the things that are going on, and these are trends that I feel like are going on not just at HKUST, but beyond in the industry, and so there's a lot of best practice examples of this, so thank you.
nobody, now, now by the time I left ranks, nobody talks about rankings anymore because they saw the evidence that we were moving forward as a school. So I think it's, it's, it's not just the rankings, it's how you manage them. And, and, at HKUSC, we didn't, we don't, at the business school, we haven't had a, done a good job of communicating our successes. And so what happens then is the only time your alums and stakeholders get to evaluate you is the time when the rankings come out. And if you weren't a corporation, you, you wouldn't, what corporations try to do is <coughs> inform the market before earnings come out or things like that, you know, so it doesn't, you know, so your share price isn't too volatile and that kind of thing. So that's, I think you got to take it with a grain of salt. For us, we we keep it on our radar because now we're at a certain point where there's kind of an expectation. But I think you know, you know, Russia has such a large economy. Um, I, I don't know how many schools are there like you guys. How many schools like us? Our price segment. Yeah. Nobody. Yeah, and so I think what you're, you know, what schools like you guys should do is really be focused on. You know, what your core mission is, you know, if it's research, if it's educating the business community and things like that, keep that front and center and then track, measure, and share with your customers, your stakeholders, your supporters, the government, whoever, and I, I think you'll be fine. So, um, but yeah, rankings have kind of corrupted a lot of the management education industry. And so, um, what I say, to, and that's the, sex, the success factors are really a decomposition of things. And so when I talk to my people, I'm not as much focused on the rankings, I'm focused on how the student experiences. Let's look at that measure, you know. Let's look at the job satisfaction. Do we get people in the right place? Are our um, companies that recruit here happy with us? You know, those things, if you do all that over the long term, whatever ranking comes out, you'll be fine, you know. So, so that's my take. Other questions? I have a question, I guess, for both speakers, which is that it seems in emerging markets, uh, probably, probably here in Russia, that there, that there is a large presence of, uh, say, traditional, maybe family-owned uh, firms that have a different top management model than multinationals. I'm just wondering to, to whether you, you see that, that your students is targeting those firms versus, versus the multinationals and how, how well the, the different schools are doing at, 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 at uh, connecting with so what I would, I would say is not just family business, but startups and entrepreneurship. Um, I think it's, it's becoming it's becoming more clear in Asia. If you're international coming to this region, that's what your future is going to look like. Um, I was reading this article about this program in Chile where they, they give startup money to foreigners to come in to start you know entrepreneurial endeavors, and and this is happening around the world in a lot of places in various different. And the, the issue is the locals aren't the people who are catalysts for entrepreneurship. So sometimes you have to, you know, import your innovators in here. And so what we've done is reposition with a lot of our European students who maybe five years ago came here because, you know what, I'm going to work for Procter & Gamble in China. And then they realize, you know what, if you don't speak Chinese, you can't market to people in mainland China. But, you know, in the entrepreneurship world and the innovation world, I don't think it's about that as much as it is about the spirit, the innovation, and the skills. And so we've done some of that there. Also, when recruiting emerging in the emerging markets, you know, we have a family business course, we have a family business center, uh, and so we've kind of put more into making this kind of opportunity, make, making this opportunity more aware, aware to the potential constituents who would come to this program. And so you know, this year I went to. Uh, Chile and Mexico and Colombia to recruit students, and you know the way we position the family business center is that if you're looking to uh, come to this part of the world, you have a family business there, and you're looking to come into this market, we have a family business center that will help you understand, um, you know, how to um, you know work in these markets, um, what are governance structures over here, how are you going to partner with them, that kind of thing. So, so I think you know, the point is uh, uh, well taken. That it's not about the traditional market where we're just the, the U.S. market where we're a feeder system to the Fortune 500 companies and things like that. And you know what's what's good is that the student who gets this kind of opportunity or understands the value of these opportunities is a much you know if you come in happy and you, there's a higher likelihood that you're going to leave happy and satisfied as far as your experience goes. So, I don't know. Yeah, you're right. That's uh, that's 
the way how people build their careers in very new country, Russia. And uh, uh, which makes it very, and, and the, this protein faculty that is <coughs> very is very of MBA is not really appreciated by many boards in Russia. If you speak about Russian-based companies, not, not international, not internationals. That is why it's very, very challenging to run, for example, a full-time MBA program in Russia. That's why now, at the current moment, there is no single full-time MBA program in Russia. Even school for school. So now we have it part-time. And I think, I don't know, I don't remember the exact number, I think about 50% at least participants of our executive MBA program and the part-time MBA program, they are owners of their own business. They are not corporate. And I think that's just a perfect example yeah. of Russia evolving to where the future is <coughs> instead of adopting a model that was based on something in the past, right? Yeah. And I think you'll see that in a lot of countries. If you go to Latin America, what you'll see is there's not a lot of full-time MBA programs. They're mostly part-time MBA programs. Because, you know, it's like now at this point, it, it doesn't make sense to forego the earnings or, you know, people are like, why'd you quit your job to get a job? You know, that's. That's always a tough question I've always had to explain in this process, right? Uh, it, but it works in the U.S. because there's such a long history of, of people doing this, but in the rest of the world, um, you know, I have Chinese parents telling their kids, why are you quitting such a good job? And trying to explain that this is for the greater good long term, this always doesn't go over well. So. You can say that for Skolko that you don't even have a career service, a business from career service in Skolko, so because our students don't need to find a job. So they come either to develop their own business or to have their own company to develop. So that, that, that's very different. But I, 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 would, I, I want to bet where Skolkovo is going to go in the future is that more part-time programs and EMBA programs are providing career services, not necessarily for them to get a job. They're building it now. Yeah, you know, so, but it's like, okay, <coughs> you're going to come to the folks in the road at various points of time, and what a lot of business schools in the U.S. have done is said, you know, for us, you know, what drives a lot of our perceived value is the number of CEOs that we have, the salaries that they have 5, 10, and 15 years out. And so these career services are kind of meant for the inflection points that people naturally come to in their different careers. And so, um, so you know, with these guys, since they're the leaders, they'll be the first to, you know, do it in Russia. And their people will enjoy such great benefits compared to other schools. And they'll help them attract even more great Russian.